Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Laurel, you're already applauding. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks for being here, everyone. The film is glorious. It is unbelievable. Oh, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, it's, uh, thus far, it's been a great conversation starter. So I hope everyone uh, has, has seen it and uh, prepared some, some good questions. Or uh, I just want to kind of, uh, I, guess, I guess we aren't starting yet. Are people still filing in? We could, I think, I, or Alex, did you want to do the intro? I think no, Eugene, Eugene is, is going to do the intro. Do the Eugene. intro. Oh, okay. Yeah, but Eugene is, okay. you know, your camera's off, right, Eugene? I'm, I'm ready to do the intro, but if Alex, you want to just welcome people, then I'll do the intro. And... Okay, but Eugene, you know the camera's off, right? I have a very special scenario. <laughs> it's, all, it's all part of his grand plan. <laughs> grand plan. All right, everybody, we're so excited to have you. Um, we are extra excited to have Arthur Jones in the house. It's gonna be amazing. I hope you all saw the film. Um, I'm not gonna say much more, just um, so happy to have you. I'm turning it over to the great Eugene Ahn who is going to introduce his friend, Arthur Jones. Thank you. All right. So, um, Alex, uh, so graciously, but inaccurately said that Eugene would be introducing Arthur Jones. Actually, I'm introducing Arthur Jones. I am Pepe the Frog, and I am the subject of Arthur's movie. And so I just felt like I would be, um, you know, so welcome to introduce this man who's been really a part of my life and a part of my rebirth. Um, so I'm just really, really excited that he's here today to speak to all of us, especially to me and about me. It's been an incredible journey for me. You know, I've, I had quite a, an exciting life as a cartoon frog before all of this hullabaloo happened. Um, and I've been, I've been appropriated and used and made to represent all sorts of causes and things. And I know, I know one thing or two about um, being somebody's puppet. Um, and it's not fun. It's a hard road. I mean, in fact, my own creator even tried to kill me, you know, so this guy that we're about to meet and hear talk, he, in a way, brought me back to life. And, you know, when you think about it, he did it through art, through storytelling, through research, you know, he's, you know, he, this film, you think it looks fun and it's pretty cool, but it's actually like a, a work of journalism. So, you know, Arthur Jones might be one of the last generation of journalists in our era of fake news and post news. And, and the fact that he made a film in an era where there's no theaters anymore, or, and it had a lot of news in it when there's no news anymore, and it's about people, but you know, they're all sort of hiding behind people like me. It's really remarkable. So I just would like to say, Arthur Jones is a very special person. He's got an incredible background as an animator, as a storyteller, as a journalist, and now add to his cap, a filmmaker. I would like to introduce to all of you, um, my esteemed savior, the person who saved Pepe or started the start of the quest to save Pepe. I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm here and I'm going strong. Please, uh, big round of applause for Arthur Jones. Wow. Wow. Um, that, that was, uh, magical. Um, thank you, Pepe slash Eugene. Um, I hope that everyone here, realizes what an amazing um, guy Eugene is and how uh, he, I mean, if, if Eugene's gonna compliment me, I'm gonna compliment him back. But he, he's one of the most like creative and voracious minds that I've ever met. Talk about interdisciplinary stuff. He's an amazing cook, journalist, photojournalist, web designer, not explorer. Um, so I really appreciate Eugene inviting me to speak with all of you. And, um, you know, it, it's really fun to, to 
even though I'm seeing him as Pepe's avatar, we haven't seen each other because of the pandemic. So um, this is really just like a, a great, fun, joyful experience to be here with all of you. Um, thank you for watching. Feels good, man. And um, thank, <laughs> thank, thank you for um, also just, um, you know, Feels Good Man is, is a film that people will often see that image of Pepe that Eugene was using as a puppet. We talked about that when we were making the film. We were like, Pepe is this puppet. And we chose to, to think about him as that as we were constructing the narrative. And unlike tonight, we also decided for Pepe not to speak because we felt as though Pepe was most powerful when he was a puppet that the audience kind of could imbue with their own kind of imagination. So we didn't want Pepe's voice to steal from some of the other more serious subject matter that we wanted to address within the film, but we did want Pepe to play a very important um, role in the film as it brought Matt's uh, world of imagination to life. Um, and so, um, yeah, so a little bit about my background is I come to film as a second career. Um, I first uh, went to school for, um, I don't know, I was a biology major for about a year and a half and I flamed out doing that. And then I transferred to an art school and I was a figurative painting major. I never went on the internet. And um, I, was, I was like one of those students that had oil paint like all over them all the time. Um, and then I graduated from school and I never oil painted again. I um, bummed around for a period of a few years. I worked as a house painter. I worked as a file clerk. Um, and then I got into graphic design. And then I spent about 10, 12 years teaching, uh, just kind of like doing graphic design, doing web design, doing HTML code, working as a freelance artist. Uh, I would start to do illustration jobs while I was also working as a graphic designer at, on a freelance basis. And then um, I started to mess around with uh, Flash, the, um, the program that is now uh, Animate in the Adobe suite. But I started to do that during my downtime at my job when I was bored. And I realized that animation was something that I loved as a kid and all of these new tools that we had really allowed me to maybe do it as an adult and do it as a career. So I started moving away from design and into animation in part because my first love as a kid was comics. Um, I've always thought that comics are something that um, is easily dismissed in culture. People don't necessarily think about comics or critical lens, but I feel like there is so much culture encoded in comics that I was fascinated both in making them and fascinated in thinking about them. And so um, when this story of Pepe came uh, to me through an unlikely circumstance, I went hiking, which is actually kind of a way that Eugene and I know each other from this hiking club um, in LA. Uh, I met Matt Fury, the subject of Feels Good Man. And I had known his work from the indie comic scene. And over a two day period, we took a hike with about 10 other friends and we camped at a hot spring. And then the next day we hiked back. And, and Matt and I bonded over the things that we love. We love music and movies and um, just kind of like weird pop culture stuff. And um, we developed a friendship based on that experience. And then in 2015, I noticed that there were big things going on in Matt's life. He and his wife had given birth to their daughter, you see in the film. And then also all of a sudden, this character that Matt had used in his comic book in his early 20s um, was on the internet and it had leaped off the internet and then jumped into the news. It was being reported on, you know, as uh, first a symbol that was used by a school shooter. And then two weeks later, it was retweeted by then presidential candidate Donald Trump, who at the time was like this joke candidate. But those two things were reported separately. But I, I felt as though that um, in my head, I was like, well, what do these two things have to do with each other? And what do they have to do with my friend's cartoon? And so, um, you know, a few months after that, I started talking to Matt about it. And I could tell that Matt was processing it in a very personal way, in a way that um, was true to himself. He was confused. He was sad by it. He didn't know what to do. And um, so 
you know, I basically was like, well, here's a vision that I have for a film because I do feel like the ultimate way that this is about artwork being stolen. Let's try to um, use art to maybe find some um, justice for you, um, but then also just kind of like let people understand this predicament because Pepe is such a unique case study for the way that social media has changed the way that every single person on the planet communicates. And it's also a case study for the way that the aesthetics and tactics and the culture jamming that trolling uses to take control of the media narrative was moving off of these message boards like 4chan, Reddit, 8chan, and taking over our mainstream politics and taking over the, the instantaneous news cycle. And so, um, you know, it seemed like it was a, a subject matter that, that you know, it was about cartoons, which I was obviously obsessed with, and it was about how cartoons are important. And then it was also just about what was going on in the country. And so we started making the film basically at the same time the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally was happening. And we were looking at that in horror to realize that this alt-right movement that had started in the weird internet was now um, getting real world traction. And it put some urgency underneath um, us as filmmakers to get this story done in a way that we felt um, didn't necessarily uh, inadvertently glorify any of the voices of that movement. Because if you remember during that time period, people like Richard Spencer or Milo Yiannopoulos were being featured in the media, but they were being featured in the media in a way that I found to be a little bit disturbing. You know, it was, Richard Spencer was often shown in the media uh, He's very photogenic, he was dressed well, he was almost treated as like a fashion model or something, same with Milo. And I felt like that was irresponsible, but I, I also wanted to make a film that was maybe artistically distinct and didn't fall into some of those same traps. And so that's where, um, you know, that, that's some of the inspiration for this film. And then, you know, I had never made a documentary film before, but I'm an animator. And so I felt as though, um, you know, the animation was something that I could do in the film that could be my sort of window into um, making a, a documentary film. And then also, um, uniquely enough, uh, doing all the motion graphics in the film, bringing the computer screens to life was a way for me to journalistically research the film. I had to go to 4chan and then basically trace 4chan and make it 4k and so it was a way for me really to just absorb the message communities these message board communities in a way where i felt like i could understand them and so um, the motion graphics were like an intrinsic part of structuring the narrative of the film they weren't just sort of b-roll or like sort of um visual fuzz that sits above the story they were really part of the way that it was constructed. And so, um, so that was, yeah, that, that was an exciting and daunting process for me. But I'm really curious um, mostly to talk to all of you. Um, and I just wanna say up front, like I want this to be like a really approachable conversation. No question is too small or too big. If you wanna know what kind of camera we use, if you wanna know how much money we spent, like these are the kind of questions that I know as students often seem, um, you know, like they're out of bounds to talk about, but this is really an open forum for us to talk about whatever you think is most useful to you um, in whatever you're studying right now. So let's open it up. So everyone, please, um, you could either put your questions in the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. This is such an incredible opportunity. So go for it, everyone. I know you've got questions. And if you don't feel like turning your camera on, I totally understand. You can ask a question in the chat. I just opened up the chat. I'll say I miss old flash animations too, Ezra. That's how <laughs> I made a lot of janky flash animations back in the day. And then I also made some janky flash animations for this movie as well. I did have a question about footage. Sure. Um, first of all, as someone who teaches both digital and painting, and you know, I sort of 
was kicking and screaming to make sure my students would all be here, especially my painting students. So it's so inspiring for me to hear that you came out of an art school with a degree in painting and oils, which I did too, and that you um, have given yourself the grace to have the kind of life where you followed your heart and followed your nose and tried different things and allowed the process to unfold because I do think that it gave you a kind of inquisitiveness inquisitiveness and a kind of um, um, multi-faceted skill set that allowed you to make a film that most other people could not begin to make um, or couldn't have the vision to to really coalesce in their heads and then have it come out. But um, so the question I have is, at some point you you found yourself making a documentary, right? And so how the, it seems like there had to have been a lot of footage that was sort of old footage, historic, or whatever the term is, you, you probably know. And then there's other footage where you kind of, now you're shooting and now you're actually making the documentary. And can you talk a little bit about that transition from the one to the other, like how the project sort of got its legs and, you know, how you, how you kind of crafted it. And also, how do you organize something like this? And I'll mute myself and I'll turn off my video. <laughs> um, uh, no, thanks for that. There's, there's, there's a lot in there and I'll try to hit all the parts of it. Um, you know, first off, I'll say that, you know, the main, the main thing that happened after I got out of school as a painting major um, that then kind of shifted my focus was, you know, as a young artist, um, I was lonely. Hanging out in a painting studio for hours by myself didn't really feel artistically satisfying to me. Um, I wanted community. And ultimately making a film is really um, an act of collaboration and making a film like Feels Good Man, which in the beginning, you know, we worked on for a year and a half with no budget. It was something that was an art project that was really about friendship and collaboration and me reaching out to my community of talented um, visionary friends and asking them questions and listening to them. And then um, also just like seeking their help. So the first thing I did in making the film was I started to collect stuff. And I spent several months just making sure I understood the story. But like you were talking about, Laurel, that involved me ripping hours and hours of footage from the internet. It involved me um, downloading thousands of memes. Um, it was something where I really felt like I just had to um, take on making a film like it was a sculpture, not a painting. On a painting, you exert your ego and your will onto the canvas. Documentary is different. You collect this pile of stuff and then you pull the stuff off that doesn't have meaning and you keep the stuff that does have meaning and the stuff that allows you to tell a story. And so I spent months collecting stuff on a hard drive and trying to organize it. And um, when, when I started collecting it, I tried to figure out how do I organize all of these Pepe memes? They're all this stuff. So I started to organize the Pepe memes by their emotion. I created a folder for happy Pepe, sad Pepe, mad Pepe, angry Pe Pepe, racist Pepe, homicidal maniac Pepe. And it turned out that that system of, of you know, organizing Pepe's became actually an organizing principle in the edit. Um, Aaron Wickenden, um, Kat Taylor, and Drew um, Blattman were our amazing editors in the film. And um, really, in the documentary process, you're only as good as your editors. And they all had different skill sets. But the one thing that we all kind of figured out as a team was that um, we, we created something called the thin green line. And the idea between that was Pepe was always going to like tie um, the film together, even though it's all of this disparate junk, these crazy ideas from the internet, we always had Pepe and that was the glue that held it together. But of course with Pepe came Matt and Matt's, Matt's a human story. In the middle of this story that, that is um, completely inhuman, we had a real human being who was sitting at the heart of it. 
and it allowed us to tell a story that's really about humanism. And so we treated it like two different films. In Matt's movie, there are woodwinds and our composer Ari plays the viola. He plucks the viola in those sections. Um, in the parts of the computer, Ryan Hope, who's the second composer, made these electronic landscapes for it. And um, we always thought about the film in terms of expansion and contraction. Um, when, we, when we would take you to a moment of like chaos and craziness, we would give you a moment to breathe with Matt. And he'll tell you about what he's thinking about all of this. And you as an audience member will get to have like a human moment where you understand him as an artist and as a man. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, you know, the, the, the process of it, but, you know, it was a lot of trial and error to get to that point. Um, and it was something that, you know, we had to redirect our focus several times throughout the film in order to get the balance of elements right. Because it's really hard to shift gears when you're editing something between archival, visuals, like visual graphics, cartoons, um, seated interviews, verite footage. It's like, it's a very, um, it's, it's something you don't necessarily think about if you're not a filmmaker, but it's something that um, I discovered was really hard to do. And we all worked really hard on it to educate ourselves as we were making it, um, which was uh, ultimately a fun process, I think for everybody. It's a film that's unique and we were excited about um, all of its unique potential. Thank you. Oh, we have we have a question in chat from. We also Aaron. have a hand up. Oh, okay. Let's let's Ella. do the hand, and then we'll we'll do let's do the chat. We'll we'll do the hand first. Um, actually, I think I'll ask it in a bit. I have a bit of a family situation. I'll be back in a few. Oh no! <laughs> to totally understand. Yeah, we'll we'll be here. Um, so uh, the question is, what are your feelings about the new Adobe Animate? Uh, I love it, but sometimes it baffles me. Um. What are the other platforms or software that you've used and recommend? Also, which of the 12 principles of animation do you use the most? I don't know the 12 principles of animation because I didn't go to animation school, I guess. I mean, huh, I mean, I, yeah, I guess I'm not sure how to answer that. The, um, so yeah, uh, I think in, in general, Adobe Animate's getting better and better for people who are animators. When I started using it, it was mostly a, a, a web program. It was made to publish things online but it's getting better and better in terms of um, look and feel for, for animators. And I found it to be a very valuable tool to just teach myself animation. Um, but then, um, you know, we, in the film, we used um, Adobe After Effects, which is the film that, which is the software I use the most. And then we also used Adobe Premiere. When we started making the film, I had downloaded crack copies of those programs that were probably five or six years old. And while we were making the film after many, many crashes, we decided to basically suck it up and pay for the licenses, which was really good. Um, and it just also allowed um, the people who were working on the film to work together rem remotely. Our editors were in Chicago, Florida, and LA, and um, they uh, all worked on the film at different times. And so um, basically what I would do is I would create duplicate hard drives with the thousands of memes and the archival footage I created and sent them to the new editors. And then we would work off the same files. So that was kind of an amazing um, process. We wouldn't have been able to make this film four or five years ago without that. Um, and then also our animators, two of them were in LA, uh, and well, including myself. So three of us were in LA and then Nicole, who was the amazing animator that um, animated the funeral sequence. Um, and then she also animated that final moment with Pepe jumping into the water. Um, she lives in Portland and she's like a master animator and she uses TV paint. Um, that's her jam. Her name is Nicole Stafford. So if you're curious about other programs, she hates animate and she loves TV paint. So we let her use TV paint for that. And I'm glad we did because she's awesome. Um, so uh, let's see here. I, I do use a Wacom tablet and um, the first Wacom tablet I ever bought, um, I bought off eBay for as cheap as possible. And now that I have a little bit more money, I, I bought the small version, but you're right. The big version is too expensive. So I like keeping them small. So. Um, questions about the camera. So, um, 
So uh, the camera we used is the Canon C300. The first set of interviews we shot on an old version that I borrowed. So Kurt Kepler was a friend of mine and um, we were in a writing group together with some other friends. And he's someone who'd made uh, some branded content um, for Adobe. And he was kind enough to let me use their camera for free. And so I went up to where Matt lives in Northern California with Kurt and his friend Christian. And we shot the first set of interviews with Matt, his wife, their roommate, Chris, um, on a borrowed C300 that didn't shoot 4K, it shot HD, which at the time I was very worried about. Um, but you can't tell, you can't tell. Um, it bumped up to 4K, no problem. And then at a certain point, um, Giorgio Angelini, who's my pal who produced the film, and he ended up shooting a lot of it in the end, um, we put a, a C300 on a credit card, and we also put a iMac on a credit card. We paid off over a two-year period, um, and the C300 was about $9,000, and the computer was about $3,000. And um, so that was something that we just, we had faith in the movie, um, and that was just kind of a leap of faith that we decided to take because renting a camera on spur of the moment just wasn't gonna be cost effective for us. And also just this movie was unique. You couldn't like plan a shoot. You would just have to kind of like, when something was happening, we had to go. And so it involved a lot of just like hopping in the car and driving hours to wherever we needed to be and shooting with whatever crew we could find. So. Um, but the C300 is a great workhorse camera, and you can find a Mach, a Mach 1 version of it for relatively cheap. And if you're going to spend money, spend money on the lenses, I guess. But we shot it mostly on a mid focal length lens, um, you know, and we used 12, I guess we, we used 13 different shooters on the film. The Hong Kong footage was actually something that was shot by a student named Diana Chan, who we found on Facebook. And for that, I basically just sent her a storyboard of the kind of shots I wanted, the kind of questions I wanted her to ask. And she went out and did an awesome job and she, saw, she shot it on her little DSLR camera. And then the next morning we had all this amazing footage in our Google Drive. It was unbelievable. It was like the, the period of time it took to get that footage from Hong Kong to our hard drive was like a two day period. It felt like magic when it was going on. So, um, that, that stuff was shot by her and she did an awesome job. And I think she's like 20. Um, so um, hopefully that's of maybe some inspiration to young filmmakers out there. Um, and I paid her for it. No, no <laughs> one worked on the film for free. <laughs> like I just say that too. Thanks Arthur. There was a question in the chat a little higher up from Emily. Oh, sure. Um, Sorry if I missed that. No, that's cool. That's why I'm here to play backup. <laughs> I love it. So um, oh, Emily. No. Emily I asked, um, I want to start animating, but I don't know what programs to use. Do you have any recommendations? I think um, yeah, I mean, I started on Flash, so, I, so I'm, I'm partial. But there are a number of free programs. If you want to do 3D, Blender is a great program that a lot of people make amazing stuff on, and it's an open source freeware animation program. So I think that, in general, animation is really about your passion for drawing. Um, and, you know, animation is really fun, but can be laborious. Um, and so I think before you spend any money on um, a program, you might want to spend money on a tablet because, and then find a free program that makes sense for you. Um, because it's really just about, uh, you have to decide if it's something that you love because animators are their own particular, um, Kind of tribe of people you have to you have to be able to sit in front of a computer for long periods of time you have to really like enjoy fine-tuning something you have to um it's a very humbling process it's something that um you know can be hard you know i didn't think about it we started the film i was like physically fatigued when we finished this film my hand hurt all the time my back hurt like animation is something that can kind of like take a toll on you, but it's also something that is lovely. My favorite moments of making the film were staying up two or three in the morning and animating these sequences. And so that's, it's a very like private pursuit. And I think you just need to decide if it's a private pursuit that speaks to you. 
see a hand up from Janice. Uh, hello. Hello. How are you? Um, good. And first, I'm glad that you have taken the time to speak with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I was just wondering, what's what was the most difficult part of filming this whole thing, or like bringing it together? Um. Well, you know, um, you know, I'd, there's there's different answers to that question. Um, in the beginning the most difficult part of making the film was deciding to do it. I spent several months filled with anxiety, not knowing as someone who never made a feature film before, if this was the right thing for me to do, if I was willing to spend basically um, a bunch of my own money on it with no promise of maybe making that money back. That was a very difficult thing. Um, but it was also a story that kept nagging at me. It was something that I would stay up at night thinking about. It was something that I would walk the dog and think about. It was something that I would drive the car around and think about. And it was something that I felt like I decided that I had to do. Um, and I'm glad you got it out. No, oh, thank you. But I think that the, there were many hard parts. Um, you know, getting funding for a film is very hard. Um, also, basically just um, getting everyone on the same page and communicating what you need from people, but then also communicating with them in a way where everyone feels heard and can bring their best self to the table is something that I found as someone who'd been an animator and a solo artist for years, like a little bit difficult because you realize you have to learn different communication skills for talking to people who are your funders. You have to learn different communication skills for talking to your editors. You have to learn different communication skills for telling a camera person what to do in, in like a, in like a real time moment. And that was something for me who'd spent basically all my time animating. All of that stuff was new for me. So it was about confidence. It was about me learning how to be confident. Um, and then uh, it was also hard for me to learn how to be public. Um, you know, taking a film out and being the face of a film is honestly something that is much harder for me than making. Um, I'm fine talking to a class, but talking to media, man, I hate it. I like this, this is fine. This is artists conversing its friends, but like the idea of doing like, uh, like we did a podcast that was like a video podcast. I was shaking the entire time. I really enjoy being behind the camera and behind the computer screen and not in front of it. So I really had actually a different feeling for Matt Fury after making the film, because I know he probably felt the same way when we were sticking a camera in his face. So I think I understood like Matt as a person more after making the film than while we were making it and that we were editing his face every day. So, yeah. yeah I was actually thinking about that because the only reason why I know about your film is because a person on YouTube that I watch reviewed it and gave it like a really good review. Oh, is it Adam? And from yeah. Movie yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. He's great. Like, a, lot, a lot of people watched it, yeah, for, because of him. Yeah. yeah, and like his basically like glowing recommendation of it is why I got interested in it. Because oh, I'll admit, one of the things I really like about your film is I'm so used to mainstream media portraying internet culture in a very specific way, you know, basically kind of not as informed about it mm -hmm. like the thing that people always joke about is the anonymous hacker 4chan thing that <laughs> was on the news yes <laughs> yeah and it's like oh you didn't do that um, so that was nice no that's great to hear um you know it's also i've actually become friends with adam since he did that review um he's hosted q and a's oh, for wow. us and i've gone on his twitch channel twice once I got oh, blackout wow. drunk on it because we were like oh. talking for like six hours. Anyway, he's a, a super creative guy. He's awesome. Um, and the movie has been really cool because actually meeting people like you or meeting people like him um, has been very valuable because that's the people that we ultimately wanted to, to like this film. We wanted this film to work for people who had grown up online and they didn't want to be talked down to, and they didn't want to be moralized, but we also wanted it to work for maybe like the standard documentary going crowd, which tends to be a little bit older, 
which isn't as online. And so we wanted the film to kind of work in both ways. And so we were lucky enough before the pandemic to show at three film festivals. And um, I felt like the audience reaction at the film festivals, there's kind of two different crowds. There's one crowd that maybe was unaware of Pepe completely or unaware of um, message board culture, image board culture. And they had one reaction to it. And then for the younger crowd that was steeped in image board culture, it's kind of viewed as, an, as a like youth, youth culture film. It has like a totally different energy. And so, um, yeah, I mean, Pepe, people were terrified that we would get this movie wrong. The people on, you know, it, it, that was one of the reasons why it was like hard to get the film made and hard to get it out. Like all the streaming services felt as though um, they didn't feel comfortable platforming it. It was something that having people like Adam vouch for us was, was pretty valuable. Yeah, because if he didn't talk about it, I wouldn't have heard about your film, to be honest. So no. I'm glad he did. I, I am and also, too. And also the fact that uh, Paley enjoyed the film. I mean, I feel like it means that it worked, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, there's going to be, there are definitely people who are deeply entrenched in these communities that were never going to like the film. And we just had to just know that that was like, and that they, and also like the film came out the same week as Mulan. And it was the second most pirated film that week. Like we knew it was a film about the internet. So the internet was gonna, um, which I, before, I mean, I bit torrent loads of stuff and then ne I never had an emotional connection to it. But when it's your film <laughs> that's being bit torn, it feels a little different. I'll, I'll admit I was a little bit illegal when I first watched it. That's so. totally, that's totally fine. I mean, it, it, it's the weirdest thing though is when people post it on YouTube and then they ask people to um, donate to their Patreon, which I'm like, so you okay, want them to pay? Yeah, it's weird, but it happens all the time. And then I'll email them or Giorgio, the, the producer will email them and I'll be like, hey, I directed the film and they don't believe you. Like when people contact the inbox on the website, they don't know that they assume like, I don't know, it's a, an intern or something. <laughs> like people don't believe that it's me who's just like, hey, would you mind taking the film down? It's, you know, we're, we haven't paid back our investors yet. We lost a bunch of money on it. So thank you. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's always a little bit of a funny uh, negotiation, but people are often really nice and they're like, oh, we didn't know that. Sure, we'll take it down. Cool movie. Thanks for making it. So. I'll let other people talk now. <laughs> no, I, but I appreciate all of that. Thank you. And yeah, I'm working on a project that's more about the hacker anonymous and Greenface anonymous and all that stuff, so. Oh, I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah. There's a bunch of questions that kind of came into the chat. There's one from Eugene. Eugene, do you just want to ask it or I could read it? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a question about the filmmaking process and, and at what point the animation um, got involved. My question in chat is how early or late in the filmmaking process did you decide on this thin green line idea and and start designing the animated sequences and and could you explain to us a little bit of the process of of um designing and creating those sequences because it seems it seems so critical to the storytelling function and and actually to the spirit of the film it's such a unique film because as you said pepe is there um on the through line in a visual way and not talking and and all that Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good question. And at some point, I'll want to hear what Natalia just bought at Costco. I don't know if you can see in the squares, but Natalia was walking out of Costco. <laughs> um, the, um, so yeah, I knew from the very beginning that animation was going to be a big part of the film. And I knew that um, uh, that was the thing that I felt like I could add to it as an artist. Like it made me feel like, oh, maybe Vice News would want to do something at Pepe, but they wouldn't have the same attachment to the character I did as someone that loved Matt's artwork, someone that knew Matt's artwork, someone that could animate these sections. Um, and at the time I thought maybe I'd be doing them all on my own. So, but when we first started making the film, uh, I scanned all of Matt's artwork. Um, I went to his home and just kind of went through his archive and thought 
um, deeply about it. And initially we had like a wilder idea. We thought the film was gonna have even more animation in it. And we thought that the storyline of Boys Club was gonna have its own narrative arc. And we were really thinking about it sort of as like a hero's journey. We got very Joseph Campbell about it, Eugene, which I know is in your wheelhouse, but we, um, we were thinking like, oh, there's gonna be kind of this like, you know, Lord of the Rings story where the boys club characters get sucked out of their happy home in, in their apartment filled with like pizza and video games. They encounter all these trolls. And then at the end of the movie, they're able to like find their way back to where they're, you know, basically back home. And we, when we started cutting stuff, we just realized that wasn't gonna work. And the way it would work is Aaron was our first editor on the project and he's an old pal of mine. So he's someone that we had a real like um, ego free back and forth. I would, he would cut something and I'd be like, I don't like that, here's why. And then I would draw something and Aaron would be like, that sucks, here's why. And I never took it personally. And I think as a young artist, that's something, if you can learn how to just um, take criticism, uh, you know, in stride. And uh, that's a very powerful tool that you can use to make yourself a better artist. And if you kind of get over your ego, um, sometimes it really helps you um, make better work. And so we, we did like a first 40 minute cut of the film where I storyboarded very loosely ideas for it. And, you know, we realized that some of the ideas were a little bit too much. And then we, we realized, all right, now we have to take um, Pepe and really um, have him illustrate these larger ideas in the film. And then also we realized that, that this served a number of functions. The first function was, you know, it, it's very easy for people to criticize Matt um, because they're like, oh, well, why couldn't he just assert his copyright? Well, that's incredibly difficult to do. There are cartoons that are remixed and reused as memes all the time, um, but they have huge corporations who have lawyers on retainer to fight for their IP, to get people to, to um, protect it. And then they also are constantly making new work. So if you see a racist SpongeBob SquarePants meme, you know that that's a derivation of SpongeBob. And then also you have Nickelodeon and Viacom and all these lawyers. Matt's just one guy. How is he gonna afford to hire a lawyer um, to fight on his behalf? That costs hundreds of thousands of dollars that he didn't have. And so, um, so one of the things that we wanted to do in the animation is kind of canonize Pepe. We wanted people to, once they see this film, they're like, I now know what Pepe, um, what the intention behind Pepe was. I know who the artist who made him was. I understand that what I might've seen on the news that says Pepe is this, I understand that Pepe was intended to be this. And so we tried to um, breathe life into those animations, even though you didn't hear Pepe speaking, you didn't hear Pepe commenting on things. Um, and we, we paid close attention not to have the internet world bleed into those animations. So you never saw like, Pepe Trump walking into our animated world, to our cartoon universe. Um, that was a space that was just, um, just pure imagination for us. Um, and so when we, and then, so we, when we started the film, um, there's the world of motion graphics, which is bringing the internet to life. And then there's the world of cartoons, which is bringing Pepe and the boys club characters to life. And the first section we cut was that little piece where Ayana is telling you about the origin story of Pepe. It's Matt drawing Ayana's butt. And I animated that sitting with Aaron in one day. And we were like, oh, this vibe is working. This vibe, like the back and forth between the edit and the animation, this feels good to us. And so, you know, whenever we'd start to get too far away from that feeling, we would come back and try to really figure out a sense of play between those two elements. Um, and then as the film was progressing, I realized I was taking on too much. I was overextending myself and I couldn't do all the things that I thought I could do to make the film. I couldn't do all the cartoons myself. So we started asking friends if they knew people who could help us. 
um, we started asking friends of friends and we found three amazing animators, Jer Jenna Caravello, Kylan Woodrow and Nicole Stafford. And um, they came on and helped me finish the cartoon parts of it, the character animation parts of it. And they really did like an amazing job, the three of them. And they became like best friends during the process. It was very satisfying. because They didn't know each other at the beginning of it. And then by the end, they were like pals and they'd been like making it. So Jenna and Kylan came in and saved my butt on that big intro animation, like with Pepe falling down the wormhole. They, they did all that section. And then um, there was a section about kind of what memes are, where you see Pepe swimming through the swamp. And that was a section that Kylan and Matt Fury worked on together. Um, the flipbook animation of Pepe through the years, that was something Matt did the storyboards for, and then Kylan animated. And then the section of Pepe swimming through the windows, the memes, I did that section. So that was kind of a group, a group effort. Um, and I think you can kind of tell. You can see how Kylan draws Pepe. You can see how Matt draws Pepe. You can see how I draw Pepe. Um, but I think that's part of the magic of Pepe. People, people like drawing him and redrawing him. It's, he's a fascinating character for those reasons. So does that answer your question, Eugene? So like, yeah, that's awesome. Thank was you. That, was that too long winded? And we didn't figure out the thin green line until about six months in. And then once we did, we were like, all right, this is great. Mm. Nice, thanks. And then we have Paola is back. Did you wanna ask your question? Yes. Um, what motivated you to become an artist? Oh, that's a heavy question. Um, drawing was always something that I loved. It was something that um, I, when I was a little kid, um, I spent a lot of time alone. Um, and drawing was always like my solace. And it was the thing that I just loved to do. I would draw ET, I would draw professional wrestlers. Um, I would draw Star Wars characters. It was the, and then I started to read like Garfield comics and Calvin and Hobbes comics. And I really fell in love with those characters. Like to me, those characters felt real. And so art was always my companion. And I was, I think, kind of like a socially awkward kid. And so um, it was the thing that I could kind of like use to make friends. Like, oh, Arthur can draw. Um, so that was something that um, I always knew was kind of part of my personality. But in terms of it being my vocation, that was something that took years to figure out kind of, and it took some false starts. Um, and it was something that my family didn't totally understand when I started wanting to do it. Like, you know, I was definitely that guy who was like, oh, I think I want to go to art school. And like all my family members would be like, oh, starving artist, ha huh? ha ha ha, like whatever, with no real like understanding of, of it or like what my motivations might be. Um, so um, that, that was, kind of the backstory and then ultimately like I just I like hanging out with artists like artists are my favorite people they're inquisitive they're curious about the world that they live in um they um care about each other um they they appreciate beauty they appreciate um intuition they they um they ingest the world around them and then create something that's specific to them and um, I've always felt like whenever I've kind of decided to quit art, because maybe I wasn't making enough money or um, I wasn't getting validated in whatever way I thought, I always come back to art because that's my crew. Those are my people. And so that's kind of, that's, that's, my, that's, that's my answer. But then also I think my other, I'm just, just straight up, like the reason that I can be an artist is because I can sit by myself for hours and hours and make something. Like, it's just like, some people just can't sit down long enough. <laughs> I feel like my superpower is always like, I can sit for 16 hours and do something. And that was something that um, uh, allowed me to get good because I was a really like crummy animator before I was a good animator. I was a crummy painter before I was a good painter. I'm still a bad painter. Um, I had a lot of false starts and you have to kind of learn from those false starts in order to get good and you can't be too hard on yourself so um, yeah, and I think the other thing that I learned was you gotta, you gotta teach yourself how to like finish things even when they're not maybe quite what you'd hope they'd be. Like I did a lot of like um, 
like I do like I do like a lot of little projects with friends, make a book, make make this or that. But I always figured like, oh, if I can figure out how to like bring something to completion, that's going to be a skill that I can apply to, to anything that I do. Even if that's like not an art project, it's like a business project with a friend or like, you know, whatever it might be. And so, um, yeah, that's a long winded, that's a long winded answer. Is, is does that, does that make sense? Or is there any part of that you want me to elaborate on? No, it's um, it's perfectly fine. Although I do have two more questions. They're small let's ones. Do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So um, you said it took years for you to figure out you wanted to be an artist. Like how many years did it did it take for it to like set in? Um, well, I think from a little kid I knew it in my head, but it took me it, it took me probably like between the age of like eighteen and and like twenty one to decide like oh this is something I'm going to study, hmm. and um that took like um, studying something else first and then realizing like basically I started going to school thinking I would be a biology major because that's what I thought like my family wanted me to do and then I just ended up hanging out in the art building in the weekends um, like um, working on they, they would set up a still life and I would just draw the still life during the weekends and I was like oh this this is what I'm into and so um, that was part of it and then I wore, after I got out of art school, I felt very confused and couldn't find a job. And so that was probably a four year process from the age of, a, you know, about like 22, 23 to 27. Um, and then at that point I started working in web design and was able to make a living doing some sort of art. And um, yeah, that was it. And I'm, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to make this, you know, I'm, I'm in my forties now. I don't think I would have been able to make this film when I was younger. Oh, and my last question is, do you have a preferred medium that you work with, like painting, like paints or pastels, charcoal or anything? Oh, well, I, you know, I like, Matt Fury draws a lot in colored pencil. I love drawing in colored pencil also, but I'm a pen and ink, um, like, I, I like high contrast. If I'm just making artwork for myself, I like high contrast. Um, bold, simple colors, big, fat lines, um, and I, I, I like, I like coloring in watercolor or 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 colored pencil first, and then I go through and make big, fat lines on top of that with black ink. Um, but but the thing that I like about Feels Good Man and documentary film is it just allows me to do so much stuff. Like I never picked up a camera before, and there's only like two shots in the film that I was holding the camera on. But you know, there is so much stuff that you just have to do for it. It, it like, yeah, it it really it was very self-actualizing to be making this film and feeling like, oh, I can I can be I'm I'm in my forties. I'm doing something new. I can learn something new. I'm excited about this. I'm going to listen to people who I respect, and ultimately, we're going to work on something together. And that was something that um, I also really love about being an artist is you never stop learning. Like, I feel like for me, it's not about ever like, all right, I'm here, I've figured this out. It's always about like, it's, it's always about like adapting and moving and getting excited about something new. So even like when we started making the film, I was like, oh, what sound, what do I want the soundtrack to sound like? I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to hundreds of new movie soundtracks and really like think about why I like this. And then I was like, oh, I love movie soundtracks. Now I listen to movie soundtracks all the time. There's stuff about it where it's just like, if you approach all the parts of it with, a, with an energy, um, it's just so much fun. So I don't know, that's, that's, that's my take on it. Thank you. But I, I realize I sound like a hippie when I say all of that. Like it's kind of hippy dippy, but it is what it is. I have a question. Hi. 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 I really enjoy your, your, your information and your, thank you for your time. Where do you see the future of animation? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, animation is, it, since, since I started animating back in the flash days, animation now, I mean, is so, so wild. It's everywhere. I guess the future of animation is augmented reality. It's these sort of, um, this sort of like slightly VR experience where animation is now kind of integrated into um, all sorts of different installation and user experiences. I think that's the future of animation. And then the, unfor the unfortunate future of animation is deep fakes. It's 
it's just the incredibly insane world of deep fakes, um, which interestingly enough, Feels Good Man is about, um, it's about uh, artistic agency on the internet and about how copyright is enforced on the internet and how tricky it is. The future of copyright on the internet is people fighting for their actual personas in terms of deep fakes. Um, that's gonna be the next forefront. So even though copyright and intellectual property seems very dry and very boring, it's actually gonna, it's kind of the only tool that you can use to like assert yourself legally online. So I would say, yes, the weird, weird world of deep fakes. I'm sure that, I mean, there was that story where Hunter Biden's laptop was leaked to a member of the press and that the person that leaked it was a deep fake. Um, we're gonna get more and more kind of interesting, weird, stories like that, that are going to ripple out through culture. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Uh, I, I use, this is, this is to Aaron Cruz. What are your thoughts on Wix, Squarespace, and other cookie cutters? I love WordPress. I'm a WordPress guy. I, I spent a year designing WordPress stuff for money. So there you go, WordPress. I'm a word, even, but we designed our website for Feels Good Man on Squarespace. Yeah. Uh, hi. yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Tupac, and thank you so much, Arthur, for uh, your time uh, and congratulations. Um, I haven't seen your film, and I was wondering which uh, uh, stream service do you recommend so that I watch it? Because I'm now I was like I kind of read some reviews, and they were really good. So I want to see which one, which platform do you recommend, and, and if that money is going to go to you guys. Uh, that's a good question. I would first say you could email. Eugene and he will hook you up with a link for the film okay. so the students can see it. Like, and that's, that's just, I mean, I, I, I would rather have people see it um, than um, feel like some barrier to entry because of cost. But yes, the reality is as an independent artist, there's not a great answer for that question. So we own the rights to the film. We didn't, we decided that we didn't want to basically I, give it, give it to a distributor. But that said, Apple, um, we get 30%, uh, okay. we, sorry, we, so Apple takes 30% of every rental. Amazon takes 50% of every rental. Jeez. So if you're spent, and then for me, then we have to pay like an aggregator price. So really like, you know, we might make a dollar tops on any of these, but ultimately I would just like you to see, see the film in whatever way is comfortable for you. But, but Apple is a slightly better, um, you know, we get paid a, a fraction more for that. I also hope that the film will be coming to Canopy soon, which allows anyone with a public library card or anyone who goes to a, a college or high school and also has like a library card, they will be able to watch the film for free. And that does actually pay um, the artists for those streams. So, so hopefully Canopy will be a great way for people to enjoy the, the film for free. But since you're sitting here in this class, just annoy a Eugene and he will send you a Vimeo link, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Right on. Um, I have a question. Sure. So um, I know you were talking about how um, you were like going back and forth really with like what you're studying and like mm -hmm. jumping around. Um, I don't exactly know what I want to study. And it's come to the point where it's like, okay, like you need to make up your mind. And um, how exactly did you know like what it was? And did you go to school for like all these things you were studying or did you just like teach yourself? Well, I, I taught myself how to make a documentary film. But I, so yeah, I went to, so first I was a biology major and then I was a painting major. Um, and those are two very different things. And um, I think that uh, in that moment, I decided to just kind of like follow my heart, um, you know, and that, that was my motivation. I knew that, uh, I think there's some people that, that choose to go into art because they're unsure about other things, but I chose to go into art because I was sure. It was something that I was like, this is, this is kind of part of my identity. It's who it's, I'm going to be doing this no matter what. So I, I didn't, I realized that, um, you know, and it wasn't a practical decision. Like my dad got so mad at me when I stopped 
you know, I think he hoped that I would like take biology, become a doctor or something, but I don't think I was smart enough for that. But the, um, but I think uh, for me, it was a process of really just like, um, if I was gonna spend a bunch of money and take out all these student loans, I wanna be doing something that I care about. And so that that's what it was for me. I think it's also just really like, I understand the pressure of being a student and, and feeling like, man, I'm interested in so much stuff. How do I make these decisions? Um, and I think that that's completely intrinsic to who you are. You know, I that's not something that I think that anyone can answer except you. But it's something that ultimately, you, I, I would, I would really. Um, listen to the, the students that you're with and see like, what, what's the crowd that I like to be part of? Do I like, if it's, if it's say you're into, you're like, oh, I actually like hanging out with the lawyers, but what kind of law, you know, there, there's all sorts of little pockets. And I think realizing that your vocation is actually your community and who are the people that you vibe with. And that was something that also was, um, you know, I, I realized kind of early on, but you know, I also will just say like, um, you know, I spent a lot of years like trying to just like figure it out. And I, I know that as a student, you put so much pressure on yourself and you're, you're so worried about the future and you don't wanna mess up, um, but it, you're gonna find your way and um, take a deep breath and um, yeah. think about what makes sense for you. And, yeah. you know, so I, yeah, I, I can't answer that question for you but hopefully with all of the stuff you've studied there's one thing that you feel like you've looked at or thought about when it's not homework and you're just like oh okay and and it's the thing that you like spending time on you know I think it's fine not to be an artist like it's not for everybody it's a hard path you know um you know even feels good man like I love making feels good man but feels good man didn't make me any money like I mean I'm mm -hmm. still freelancing doing other stuff and I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy doing that. I'm happy doing that. But it's just something like, that you just should be aware of, yeah. I feel like there's just a lot of pressure because um, like everybody's like, oh, do something that will make you like so much money and do this and do that. Mm -hmm. Like I had um, a counselor telling me like, oh, I don't think you should go into art. Like, how are you gonna make money? And I was like, I don't know, like, I don't know. I like, I, I'm not gonna know. And so I feel like I get there. Yeah, and that's yeah. what kind of, it's kind of scary it's kind of like okay I just have to do it like a leap of faith at this point and like see well if you're feeling really genuine about that leap of faith then then listen to yourself and trust and trust yourself but I will also say like art is always there for you mm -hmm. um you know I think that even if I had like continued on my path and done a biology degree um you know and I and I I think that I probably still would have made art. Like, I think art for me has always been like, um, you know, with Feels Good Man, like I didn't go to, like I didn't go to school for film, like I didn't go to school for animation, but those are ultimately the things that I, I did teach myself and allowed me to make the film. But those were extensions of my passion. Like on a Friday night, I wasn't going out, I was animating something, you know? And so I think for art, if you feel, a tr if you're truly compelled, you should know that art, if you're, if you're someone, and also if, if you're someone who works hard, you can make art into your passion. In the social media age, there's all sorts of new avenues for art. And there's all sorts of new hustles that you can hustle. And so I think that, um, you know, it's not as impractical as it once was. Um, but I also think like, if you want to make a more practical decision right now, just realize art is always there for you. And when you're 25 or 26 and you're, you know, art isn't something that you have to go to school for. Um, so so I, I would say, um, you know, it's great to be an art minor too, you know? And if you have your first job and you're like, this isn't for me, you know, art is always there for you and you can um, create like, sorry, my dog is making all sorts of crazy noises right now. Um, but you know, I think that talk talk to talking to your counselor is good, but talk to your friends, talk to your family. What are the things that you've been interested in your whole life? How do you like spending your time now? And then who are the students that you vibe with and what are their majors would be maybe some 
ways to 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 think about this. But you know, ultimately, I don't know. I I, I sympathize. It's really hard. It's really hard to figure yeah, this stuff I've out. I've been you know? stuck since senior year, and I'm yeah, like gonna be twenty this month. So you got time though. <laughs> 20 yeah. is so young. 20 is so young. I know that it feels like you've got a lot of pressure on you right now. Um, and, you know, may, maybe you are feeling pressure from other people in your life. But, um, you know, I would, I would also just like, it, sound, it sounds silly, but make a list. Make a list of like, oh, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. This, and it's a general list, you know? And mm -hmm. then really just like take thinking about it seriously you know, and um, yeah, ho hopefully, hopefully, you know, you, you, you can figure it out, but I really, yeah, it is, it is super hard, and I, I have to say also, when I was in art school, I spent the entire time thinking that I might be fucking up my life, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for, I'm so scared about that, <laughs> like, I'm just like, but oh I, yeah, I felt like I had to do it, so, <sighs> we'll see, I guess, thank you, Sure. no and i yeah i i yes i'm i'm rooting for you i feel i feel like i i hope that you come to a decision that you feel good about and you feel uh you know was the right thing for you <clears throat> i'm gonna Thank i'm you. gonna let my dog out just because she's making a crazy noise i'll be back in 30 seconds hold on this might be a good moment to just um check in. We do have the film continuing to screen online for free for anybody. Um, just go to vamagallery.com and there's a little place where you can put your email in, put your, put your um, LACCD email in and you will get an email back. Uh, awesome tool built by my web design students. Um, and then you can go watch that film whenever you want for the next week. Daytime, nighttime whatever. All right. Who's next? Uh, we had a few questions in the chat that um, kind of, the, the chat is really popping off. <laughs> oh, can, <laughs> really would, nice. you, would you mind reading some highlights? Uh, yeah, not at all. So, um, Thank you. Kim, Kim had asked, um, how did you ever pitch your film to a production company or did you just want to move forward without limitations? And then Lisa had asked, how did you get, how did you find your investors? Uh, man, okay, there's a process. So yes, we pitched the film to a, lot, to a lot of production companies. It was something where people knew the story of Pepe, so that would get us in the door. But then once you were in the door, people sometimes just didn't know what to do with you. Because there were moments also, I have to say, that one of the reasons we were making this film is because people thought Matt Fury was a Nazi. Like sometimes people would assume that because Matt drew Pepe and Pepe had been declared a hate symbol, that he must have been a member of the alt-right. Like he was like the cartoonist for the alt-right or something. And so that was another kind of reason that we wanted to um, make the film. But, you know, I, I will tell you like, here's, here's a deep behind the scenes one that's fun. Um, we pitched it to Dan Harmon, the guy that makes Rick and Morty. And he liked it. And at the end of the meeting, we thought, oh, we just found our, guy he's gonna give us the money and then and Giorgio and I like we we high-fived each other outside the office and we went and like spent money on like a, a bottle of wine and we just like got drunk and thought oh the ship came in we figured this out and then he never emailed us back he's a nice he's, he seems like a nice guy but that happens a lot people will sort of promise you something and then they just don't follow up you know and so we um and that happened a, a couple times in this movie because it was a film that people were, we made a really nice, so, so we, the first thing we did is we made like a two minute teaser for the film that was really fun and kind of crazy and very like pulpy. And um, that, that served us pretty well. We sent that to the people who we knew in the entertainment industry and some of them sent it to some other people. And we got some meetings and some phone calls from that. And then we started writing grant applications and we spent about six months writing grant applications, which are very involved and take a long time. And, um, but very helpful. It helps you figure out, like when Eugene was asking, like, when did you figure out the thin green line? We figured out the thin green line is that you had to write about the film and think about the decisions you're making. You know, it's like writing an artist statement. 
and you're just kind of like chewing on the subject matter, putting it on the page, chewing on it again, putting it on the page. And so, um, but then I made this decision where it was like, I, I can't write any more grant applications. My, I'm going like, I'm driving myself crazy with grant applications and we're not going to get any of this money. And we're not going to get this money because it's like, you know, people don't, people, it's a, it's a tricky film by someone who's unproven, that someone being me. And so, um, so I just decided I was just going to work second jobs. Um, and that's the way we were going to do it. And I wanted to make a film, not ask money, not ask for permission to make a film. And so that's how it started. And then we were able to find money basically after we had a 50 minute cut of the film. And in that 50 minute cut, like I was saying, like I'd animated sections of it. Like it was, it was a something where if you watched it, you'd be like, oh, okay, this is, this is a competent film. It looks good. Um, and, and then we were able to find, um, we brought on a producer named Karen Capitosto who had worked on other well-known documentary films. I sought her out. I was very shrewd in that. I was like, well, we need someone who knows people who have money. And she knew people who had money. And so we were able to pair with this company called Wavelength Productions that's run by um, this woman named Jennifer Westfall. And um, they, they provided us with about $200,000 that allowed us to start like paying ourselves back a little bit and then allowed us to then like get an office and hire, um, hire Kat Taylor, who was our second editor. And she edited on the film for about four months. And then um, we ran out of money and then we had to go find other money. Um, and then that was, you know, that was just a process of asking wavelength like, hey, all right, you're a production company. You know other rich people who have their own production companies. And it's just like, you know, it's just like a game of telephone. You just start asking people. But again, that was like um, picking collaborators and being shrewd about the people you collaborate with. But it wasn't um, an, an easy process. And then we, so we had, we'd raised about $400,000 and then the film, and we made a, a version of the film that was good. Um, and then we got into Sundance. And then once we got into Sundance, we were then able to raise about another $100,000 because people wanted to be involved with the Sundance film. And then that allowed me to pay myself back and allowed for us to like pay for color correction and allowed for me to pay the animators a little bit more and allowed for us to hire Lawrence Everson, who did all the sound effects in the film, which is a very important part of the film. And he did an amazing job on it. And it really made this film that was like a very homemade affair feel like a Hollywood film when you're sitting in a theater and listening to it in surround sound and stuff. He's, uh, he's a genius of a dude. And so, um, yeah, that's, I, I realized that, uh, yeah, ho hopefully that answers the question in, in, in some way, yeah. And then I know we uh, we're running a little over. Do you have time maybe for one? one oh yeah, I know I'm I'm fine to chat. If there's more okay. questions, let's finish all the questions. I'm happy to be here. So there was a question from Elijah, um, and I'll read it. But also Elijah, if you want to unmute, feel free. So um, Elijah wrote, "I had a piece of art I made, or I kind of saw him unmute. I had a piece of art I made." Yeah, I've been bar bonded. Uh, okay, cool. Go for it. Yeah, um, I had some art I made that was co-opted by the alt-right and used to promote uh, Pizzagate on a much smaller scale than that. Um, but uh, I was just uh, wondering, he seemed to go through a mental process of eventually uh, accepting it and um, not accepting it becoming a hate symbol, but uh, accepting uh, his involvement in it or non-involvement. And I was just wondering if you had any um, advice on um, uh, trying to think how to phrase this. Um, any advice if, you know, uh, we lose control of our art and it becomes something we didn't intend it to become? Um, there's, there's no clean answer to that. Um, you know, 
Pepe was unique to Matt because Matt has such a singular style that if you see something that that Matt draws, it all looks like Pepe to a certain degree. So I don't know the art that you made necessarily, though it's funny. I, I have some friends who also um, they they had they got kind of cited as in Pizzagate stuff because they had a music video that had a swirl in it. It had like a swirl that kind of looked like what some of the pizza gators thought was like a symbol for pedophiles essentially. And um, it, they got trolled and harassed by that. And so um, it's a tricky situation. I think the one thing that, um, you know, there's a double-edged sword with social media. Um, it means that um, every artist kind of basically has to approach themselves as a brand in order to survive in the gig economy. And if you have something like terrible press or a bunch of weirdos grabbing your artwork and using it, um, it messes with your ability to brand yourself as an artist. So you have to have people understand who you are and what your intentions are, you know? And um, that's not an easy solution. Matt eventually came around to figuring out what worked for him but it's not a template for really anybody else because this hasn't happened before. And I will also say like, Matt could have handled this the wrong way. He could have just like gone onto 4chan and asked everyone to stop using Pepe or go onto Twitter and, you know, at everybody that was using Pepe. And that would have probably been disastrous. You know, um, he would have just gotten trolled more. So sometimes the answer is just not feeding the trolls and letting it go away. But Matt couldn't do that with Pepe anymore. I think that's probably often the most pragmatic advice um, if it is used by a specific person, then you have like a little bit more tools. But if it's used by this kind of amorphous, anonymous mob, it, it's, it is difficult. And um, luckily now, when we started making Feels Good Man, a lot of people didn't want to have these kind of conversations. They felt like they were kind of too toxic to touch. But I now think that one of the nice things about Feels Good Man is a nuanced, complicated discussion about how the internet is affecting everything is a conversation people are willing to have now. And Pizzagate used to be something that was like so fringe and weird that not everyone knew about it. But now let's face it, people who were into Pizzagate were, were storming the Capitol. This stuff is real. Like it's affecting um, consensus reality. It's threatening democracy. So I think that people have agency to speak about it in a way that they didn't maybe four years ago when Pizzagate was a thing. Cool, thank you. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Arthur. We have just, I think, like a final comment, really. Um, Aaron wrote, thanks for the words of motivation and inspiration. We need more reaffirmations of the beauty and transformation that art brings. Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate that, Aaron. That's great. Oh, wait, now I see some hands up. Um, I see Tupac and Janice. I think I saw Tupac first. Hi, um, I, there was just one question from, I don't know if it was already asked, if I may have missed it, but it's from okay. Alex Wiesenfeld. Did you get any personal pushback from the alt-right? Um, you know what? Um, we were very nervous about that while making the film. We kept the film on the DL while we were making it. We didn't tell anyone we were making it at the time. We were very cautious about not having rough cuts of it leak, not having the teaser leak. Um, I knew some friends who had gotten trolled for other reasons. And uh, that made me very nervous. It made my family nervous. Um, it made uh, my friends nervous, but uh, it made Fury nervous too. But I have to say the opposite has actually been the case. People aren't as bad as you think they are. We've gotten more nice notes uh, from people who the film touched than any member of the alt-right. We've gotten, I've gotten no personal blowback from anybody other than a couple weird Instagram DMs. And you just kind of delete those and move on. Um, I think that the timing of the film is such that um, Pepe had kind of blown over a little bit in that community. It was like, he's kind of played out at that point. And it allowed us to then have like a discussion about the film. And certainly if you go look at the, comments under our YouTube or Facebook, you see a lot of predictable stuff, but that stuff you can't take personally. I don't read the comments. So, um, so no, the answer is no, people are okay. And for the most part, people like the film and were very nice to us, which was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much.
Oh, thank you. And, um, Janice, do you, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. I was just wondering if you've, I don't know how recent this is, but there's an HBO docuseries that came out recently. Um, I think it's called, yeah, I was going to ask if you heard about that. Yeah. Because the subject matter really reminded me of Feels Good Man, but mm -hmm. arguably a bit more depraved in my opinion. Um, arguable, but yeah, certainly yeah. there's a lot of overlap. And I mean, I know some of the people in that documentary from, from we're on the same journalistic beat. So uh -huh. um, yeah, so I mean, but that, that speaks to actually a larger point is that people will often dismiss these kind of weird internet stories as maybe being something that is something we shouldn't talk about and shouldn't take seriously. But, you know, QAnon started in 4chan. That's where it started. It was a prank on 4chan. And then for whatever reason, it took off like wildfire. And it ended and up- And it moved over to 8chan. Exactly. And I will also say the other thing that in that documentary that I like is in episode two of that documentary, they kind of really talk about the different platforms. All of this actually happened in Japan before it happened in America. Two channel was a fun site that started with a bunch of anime nerds on it. And then um, it developed into the net right, which is what they called it in Japan. And there were a bunch of people who made like very anti, made super racist comments, mostly about Koreans and Chinese people on that. And there was a political movement that came out of it that was extremely reactionary and toxic. Um, and so it kind of just points to the fact that this is a feature, not a bug within all of these, um, within all of these platforms that have their own attention economy of extreme ideas. And so, um, so you know, that documentary gets into it a little bit, um, but you know, it's also interesting. That documentary is kind of a very different stylistic film from our film. The documentarian uses is front and center in it. Also, say they stole one of our edits that I'm upset about. Really, in that film. really. But that that's inside baseball. Spill it. The <laughs> section, the section with the Christchurch shooter, they basically stole shot for shot our section with the oh, Hillary. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Where the way we told the story about the the Hillary rally where someone yelled Pepe. Oh, but I would argue oh, they, they did it in a, in a little bit more of a blunt fashion. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird. Yes, but. Um, yeah, it's wild. Yeah, I, I mean, I know Fred, I know some of the people in that, so it's a crazy thing. Yeah. I'm raising my hand, but I can't find how to do that in reactions. So no um, <laughs> just you mentioned journalism and VAMA, Visual and Media Arts, has studio art, it has graphic design, it has animation, it has photography, it has journalism. So I wanted to have you talk a little bit about the connection for you between journalism and your, the visual work that you make. I know you do animated graphics that explain journalistic, you know, data information and stuff. If you could really talk about how, where journalism lives in your practice. Sure. Um, you know, journalism was, was, you know, this is something Eugene and I haven't common you know Eugene worked as a journalist and has now kind of gone off into all sorts of other sort of secondary career paths but journalism has continued to like inform his practice the entire time um, so yeah initially I started off as being a graphic designer um, working at uh, like I was a freelance graphic designer working at the New York Times basically coding CSS and HTML nothing super glamorous with that but um, then I moved on and did some work um, in their video department. Um, and it was something that when I, when I was doing that stuff, I wasn't doing any journalism per se on my own, but I did realize that um, having someone who was a visual thinker in the room with journalists was exceptionally valuable because it's really just about how do you shape a story for the social media age and people are reading less and less, people are watching more and more things like infographics and animations are actually very, very, very important. And right. more closer to the film feels good, man, memes are incredibly important. And I don't mean memes like you just have image macros, the combination of text and words, the way that people are able to share, normalize ideas, pass them around, all this sort of stuff is incredibly important to journalism and it's kind of the future of the medium. And so for me as an artist, um, it was something that, I was, as I have gotten older, I've gotten more political, more politically minded. 
Um, I've gotten more serious as a person. Um, and journalism was just kind of something that I started to hang out with journalists more. Um, I started to do more um, web explainers for um, activists and journalists who I appreciated their work, like the Center for Investigative Reporting in Berkeley, um, working with um, you know um, multimedia developers who, and when I was doing that, I often would be like, oh, I wish that I was, I wish that I was the one maybe like telling the story, not just drawing the story. And so, um, so, but that just kind of demystified the process to me, gave me a little bit of confidence that it's something I could do. I, a lot of this stuff is giving yourself permission to do something. And so working in those kind of rooms and in those kind of environments made me feel like I could do it. And then also, um, you know, I, I was also, I, I also just realized that I wanted to make art about the world we live in. I didn't want to make something that was totally about fantasy or something that was an expression of my own inner ego. I wanted to make something that was um, uh, like thought provoking and connected to the world in a way that, um, I, 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 that, that meant something to other people. And so, uh, even though that's kind of a grandiose sentiment, um, I was led to documentary through that that itch. But you know, I think that journalism is something right now that's also under attack. Um, not under attack just in terms of the post truth era. It's under attack in terms of like businesses and business models. It's very hard for journalists to make a living, as hard for a journalist as an artist. And um, we're realizing that journalism is really important and we have to figure out sort of infrastructures that support journalists that the internet isn't always friendly to. And so, yeah, long-winded, long-winded answer, but that's, that's, that's my thoughts about it. Thank you. Hi there, I'm gonna butt in here. I um, just wanna say you've been incredibly generous and inspiring and oh my God, what a great, great talk. I, um, I know we could go on all night, but <laughs> this was already half an hour longer than then you committed oh, so thank no you so much all. thank you thank you and um yeah everybody i guess uh give well th th thanks for the good up. questions someone sent tupac the movie um we don't know ah. what was bought at costco but that's a cliffhanger <laughs> that we'll, we'll all figure out so um yeah thanks thanks for coming everybody thank you so thank much you. thank you it was really great thank, thank you, you. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Right on. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.